welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 163, featuring the third and final installment of my interview with Mr. Graham Devine. In this part of the interview, we talk about the fall of Trilobite and the not-so-successful follow-up to the seventh guest, aka the eleventh hour. We also talk about Clan Destiny and some of his later games, including Halo Wars, and what he's doing now on the iPhone, and follow that up with his thoughts on the future. A lot of great stuff in this episode, so without further ado, here is Mr. Graham Devine. Well, what did you think about the other, uh, you know, big CD-ROM adventure game? Uh, <laughs> Mist. I love Mist. People who say I don't love Mist, they, they, everyone should play Mist. The only time that the, 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 the Miller brothers and I, I think, ever had a kind of a tiff, they put on their box Elite Frogs Trilobites the Seventh Guest, and that oh, really pissed me wow. off. That was. Um, up until then, we'd been talking, and I still talk. I don't care. But um, I just remember being very upset by that kind of, you know, the one thing that they did right there was a, a marketing thing. It probably wasn't even them. It was probably uh, um, Brodevund. But uh, eh. but I love Mist, and I love the manhole. The manhole was actually my favorite game. Well, let's not talk then about the 11th hour. Uh... This was released a couple of years later, right? And uh, I was reading that apparently there was a lot of, I guess, development issues or something. It ended up being a year late, later than it was uh, intended. Uh, so what, what happened with this? Well, it's weird that people, we have very correcting memories on late. Um, in Seventh Coast, it was nine months. It was going to be six, so it was three months late. And oh, my God, it was painful to be those three months late. Uh, 11th hour was 18 months, it was meant to be 12 months, so it was 6 months late, um, and it was just, yeah, that was also very painful. At that time, game development was just learning to go from a game takes 3 months to make to, okay, we're going to give you 6 months in this one, and it better be really freaking good, to, you know, Halo Wars was 4.5 years and 120 people, and uh, games were transitioning. So I, I don't think Trilobite managed that transition very well because I don't think anyone could. We couldn't guess that the game's going to get so much more complicated and that um, you know, transferring files on networks was going to start to take minutes a day and backups going to start to take hours a day and your know, art files are going to get so much larger. And, um, it was an interesting time for games to, to transition. Um, but the development was still fraught with, um, you know, Lots of, you know, Rob and I started to argue um, about, about the game and about the company, and um, I, I think the game suffered because of that, and um, it, it, it was tough times. It was a tough to make game. So it was just the, I guess, the, uh, the tension caused by the rapidly changing market realities, is that? I think that, that I think more so the direction of the game, um, you know, um, Rob wanted to get into making games that appealed more to um, more to a mature audience, and I was Scooby Doo, Scooby Doo, Scooby Doo, and I still am Scooby Doo. Uh, uh, and so we started to argue about a a actual content in games and direction of games. And um, at that time, we were both, you know, mega stars of the industry, and we could do no wrong. So it was. Uh, you know, when our egos collided, our egos were both large, and it was unfortunate. And um, we, we were young, and we were foolish, and we, are, we, we should have worked it out better. Well, was, it's, uh, my understanding that uh, I guess this was probably uh, Rob's idea was to have a lot of R-rated, you know, scenes in we the game. Uh, and you sound like you were, and it was, you know, directly opposed to that. So is that was that creating a lot of uh, strife? That would create a lot of strife, um, and that would. I don't work. Yeah, that's it's. It, it was tough. Um, I, I I want to make Scooby Doo. I would still go and make a Scooby Doo game today. Um, and as much as you know, I enjoy watching R-rated movies. I have a hard time working on such on, on medium like that. Eventually, that's why I left it. So that's it's. I just yeah. Well, it's said to be, I don't know, I wonder if you think this is a fair comment, that uh, The 11th Hour is the game that killed Trilobite. Yeah, it's probably true. Um, I mean, probably Seventh Guest was the game that killed Trilobite. 
the success of Seventh Guest was was its was Trial of Light's biggest success and its biggest problem. Um, we weren't ready for it. We didn't have the right people, I think, around us advising us on business. Um, we had venture capital that was looking to take us public, and we were just were. I don't know why they thought that was a good idea in retrospect, but we were young and influential and uh, being told that this was okay. And it wasn't, it wasn't good. It wasn't okay. We should have stayed small. We should have focused on making games and Rob and I could have resolved our differences and we would have still been around today. Yeah, I was just kind of wondering now that you're older and more experienced, you know, if you could somehow go back in time to when you were working on the 11th hour, uh, what would you want it, What would you do differently? I think I would be, well, A, I don't know how to finish the game because I've, I've written the code. <laughs> but B, I would be, I'd be much more accommodating. Um, I would let Rob, I would sit and work that out. I would go in and uh, with, with open heart and work that out. That's the only approach to life that's, that, that I know of today. So I, I would apply that, to, that wisdom I have now to the, to the time machine back then. What about Clandestiny? This is a, a 1996 game that uses a lot of cartoon animation. It's, you know, it seems to be un, uh, obscure. Uh, what, what do you think of the game? Well, I love it. I bought, um, I own the rights to that one still, so of course I love it. <laughs> um, that was, you know, my answer to 11th Hour. So it was, you know, for a long time until in, in, in a trial of it, it was uh, Graham Devine's Clandestiny. And um, that irked Rob a lot, and that was properly, you know, changed to clandestiny. Um, and um, that was my answer to it, you know, and if we'd been small and if we'd focused, we could have worked out and I could have done the clandestiny games and he could have done the other tower games and all would have been good. Um, but I love clandestiny. I mean, it was, um, I think, it a terrible job at, um, at marketing it because uh, and selling it because we thought at the time, hey, we could uh, we can sell our own games, we can market our own games, and, and you know what? We're really good at making games, but we really suck at marketing our own games. We really suck at selling them. Um, so it was uh, it, it was an interesting game. It was interesting to work with uh, with real animation out of out of Korea. You know, it was it, on paper and digitizing. Oh my God! You played Dragon Slayer. Oh yeah, yep. Um, Princess Peach. What about Uncle Henry's Playhouse? This is uh, up to 1996 at this point. Yeah, that one was. Um, um, we'd made all these puzzles, and we realized that people were pulling away from FMV, and FMV was no longer a real good idea to put into games. Um, even though we were still planning on making games that used FMV, so we wanted to. Um, and we realized that a lot of people weren't actually playing our games because they were put off by the FMB and story, but they wanted to play the puzzles. Um, and the puzzles we'd made were fantastic. I mean, we made these fantastic games and AIs and so forth, and we wanted to get them into one package. Um, so some people, you know, say that, you know, it was a last ditch attempt by trial by to save itself. But it, no, it, it was a good idea. It was a fantastic idea for a game. Um, then it, you know, I think the Wikipedia page has it sold 167 copies. I'm like, <laughs> 167? It sold more than that. I have no idea where that figure came from, but uh, it, it did okay. And um, yeah, unfortunately, it was another game that we tried to sell ourselves and tried to market ourselves, and we were terrible at that and terrible at uh, at, uh, at selling. But it was a realization that F and B was over, as I think Uncle Henry's Playhouse. So you were saying earlier, though, you don't think FMV is, is dead, right? It's uh, in no, hibernation, I, perhaps? Uh, what do you think about it, about it now? Um, well, I guess in, you know, in, in terms of storytelling, um, the success of Seventh Guest was that uh, the FMV was not about you. You were not the hero um, in, in the FMV. In the player never saw himself. They never saw the... Uh, so you explored the house and you were the, the player exploring it. Um, the problem with FMV now is that we show the hero and, you know, we show Nathan Drake and he's this glorious looking Indiana Jones character and FMV is fabulous. Um, but I think the key to FMV games is always about not showing the hero and letting the player be the hero uh, and just showing, you know, little bits of interaction with FMV. I think that's still perfectly fine. 
Um, I think people like to explore stories that way. And I think games like um, um, Half-Life and Half-Life 2, that you walk up to the lab and the in, in the lab and having a discussion, that to me is a modern version of FMB. Um, I'm not seeing myself, I don't see you know, me, but I'm walking into a conversation. And now it's 3D, yes, but it's still FMB. Well, you are the designer of Quake 3 Arena. You know, again, I think most of the civilized world is played at some point, right? I have a question here from James Mays. He wants to know, did you have any input into id Tech 3? He'd also like to know if you were ever at odds uh, with id software associates on the design of the game. Oh, boy. Um, well, first of all, when I came to id, in, um, there, was, there was a game called Quake 3, and it, it existed just fine. Um, in John's idea was um, that you should, you know, bring out of a console up and type connect to an IP address and go play a deathmatch. Um, so my contribution to the game is more of, you know, no, we need menus. No, we need something that ties it all together. Yeah, we need, um, we need more than one character type. People like to have uh, characters. Yeah, we need bots. Um, and it's kind of bringing it around to an actual complete game feeling. Um, so the but the arguments it did were, were were of the best kind. I mean, we would argue for hours over the degrees of angle that uh, would come out of the shotgun, and how many pellets should come out. Should it be eleven or twelve? And should it do ninety damage a piece or ninety-two damage a piece? And should the angle be twelve degrees or thirteen degrees? And that was almost you know to the point of you know yelling, fighting, absolute anarchy over it. But Oh my God, if I'm going to have an argument with, with someone in the game industry, I want it to be about how many pellets come out of a shotgun. Because <laughs> that's the degree of care that we put into that game of, and the balance. And I think that shows when people play the game of the incredible balance in Quake 3 of, of all the weapons comes out of us yelling and screaming at each other to actually get that game you know, as close to perfection as we could in terms of, in terms of game balance. So I love those arguments. Wouldn't do them again, but I love them. Yeah, I still know plenty of people that play play the game, you know, swear by it. I, I got another question here from Jack Day. He wants to know uh, what you think about the decline of bots and uh, CPU players. I still think you see plenty of bots in games. I just don't think you realize you see them anymore. I mean, when you go play Mass Effect, you're playing with a whole bunch of bots. Um, when you play um, any World of Warcraft game, you're playing with bots. When you go play Star Wars Old Republic, there's bots. Uh, if you mean the first-person shooters, um, I, I think people, the, the, you know, the internet has changed that, right? I mean, there is, it's now no longer a modem connection to get onto the internet. It's, so you, there's, there's no need to go ask your mom, can I use the phone for two hours whilst I go play people online? <laughs> it's just there. So bots just changed. They didn't go. They, they, they just left first-person shooters because of, you know, now I can go play with a friend. I know that's one of the things that you're celebrated for is uh, supporting, being a big advocate of the Mac. Yes. You know, as a gaming uh, platform. And I'm just wondering, what do you think is the difference between, if if at all, or if any, uh, the difference between a, a PC gamer, a console gamer, and a Mac gamer? Oh my God! You can't ask that question. <laughs> oh, I love them all. I love all gamers. Um, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> um, at QuakeCon, um, you would see people bringing in all kinds of PCs, and you'd see the occasional Mac. Um, and Mac gamers, I, I can't answer this question. Um, Are you afraid of hurting their feelings, or, or what? Yeah, of course I am. It's an, well, I think it's changing too, right? I mean, Mac OS X has become so much popular in the home. Steam is now out on uh, on Mac and uh, and out on PC. Uh, uh, you know, the thing you find with PC gamers is they have the ability to augment their computer easily. So um, they do stick the graphic cards in, they stick the sound cards in. They aren't afraid to buy the headphones with the with the with the um, um, with the microphone built in. So there's a lot more community around PC uh, for the mods. Um, on Macs, because it's um, it's an all built-in computer, you can't hardly open it. Um, you know, the camera's built in, the microphone's built in. You can't change the video card out. There's, I don't think people are as into you know um, the modifying their computer for the best possible gaming experience. Um, 
And it's, you know, I don't know if the people who own them are actually that much different, though. Um, I, I think slowly over time we've come together, and now we've reached peaceful times, and I, I don't wish to disturb that peace. Okay, so you also worked on some uh, Game Boy Advance uh, ports or versions, too. We've got Commander Keen, Wolfenstein 3D, Doom 2. Uh, that's, you know, that's, that's pretty interesting. So, you know, how did you get in the end of that? Well, I started with Game Boy, with, on a Game Boy in Mastertronic. I did um, a, a Game Boy version of, um, of um, Prince of Persia. Uh, and then I did a Game Boy version of Spot and a Game Boy version of, of um, um, uh, some Vegas game. So I, I guess I knew how to program them. Um, because Z80, same as the TRS-80, and the Game Boy Advance games, I didn't so much do the programming on, as just kind of make sure that they worked okay, um, and make sure that um, um, it's, it's very easy when someone is, uh, is working on a Game Boy Advance, you know, to sit and say, well, it's impossible to do on this platform. Uh, it just can't do that. And... Um, the last thing you ever want to tell someone to id is it's impossible to do on that platform because I can program, John can program, we both know the, uh, the platform fairly well and we all present you with options. Um, and that's more of, that was more of our job there on, on Game Boy Advance than anything else was to present people with options of how to think past and think outside the box. Is there a doom for the TRS-80 yet? I would do it. It's possible. I would, nothing's impossible. All right, so then you moved to Ensemble in uh, 2003 and uh, was the lead designer on, on Halo Wars. You know, another uh, big, must have been a big shift uh, for you, right? The, well, I mean, it's, it's a pretty big team, right, that worked on... Uh, oh, yeah, 120 people in four and a half years. It, it, it was hell. Um, hell. <laughs> game, an absolutely fantastic game, and the team was the best team I worked with. Um, but the, at the end of it, I mean, Microsoft had told us that the, that the company was closing. And, yeah, that's not exactly a great way to go out. But we played, I played Halo at id. Um, I remember that the Xbox came out and that um, the Halo was on it, and um, first-person shooter. And I played Halo at Macworld when they were showing Halo for the first time on the, uh, um, the Mac G3. And, um, and so I was interested to see how I played with a controller. And I was surprised, you know, played so well with the controller. Um, and, you know, I remember Christian and I it played all the way through in, in multiplayer, in, in split-screen mode, quite, you know, um, Halo 1, and we're like, wow, this is actually really possible. So when the opportunity came up to work in the Halo universe um, as Ensemble, I was all for it because, A, it's a universe full of story, and, um, and Bungie's very concerned about story, and I love story. Uh, and I love filling games with story. Um, and it was an RTS game, and I loved the fact that it was two sides that were so uneven. Uh, that, you know, humans versus, you know, this, this alien force, the Covenant, is just so powerful. Um, and so that story, to me, was, was one worth telling of this, you know, the, you know, the, the humans versus aliens is just a great, a great backdrop for a game. Um, so I loved making that game. It was, um, I, I think it turned out fantastic, given that uh, um, the Microsoft kind of, you know, took the rug from us at the last minute there. From you know, but yeah, loved it. Uh, what was that about Microsoft and a rug? Well, micro, um, with about six months to go on a game, um, Microsoft came in and said, "Hey, we're going to close the, uh, the we're, we're closing the studio, uh, but we want you to finish the game." Um, and it's very hard to finish a game, given that you know that, that when you finish the game, you'll have no more job. Yeah, it did wonders for morale, I'm sure. And it, but to our credit, um, no one left. We all stayed and worked on the game, and we made, I think, you know, a fantastic game. That so it was. Uh, it, it was a swan song. It was. Uh, it, it, it was. A, a huge flag in the sand for RTS on, on the console. As much as Halo proved that um, you could go make um, first-person shooters on the console work with controllers, Halo Wars proved that you could go make RTS games on the console with, uh, and have them play well with controllers. All right, just a few last uh, questions here. Uh, so in 2009, you, were, uh, you worked for Apple, and the job description I saw said that your job was to make sure that the iOS was a good platform uh, for games. 
I'm just wondering, what does that actually mean? You know, and and I just kind of did people come to you with ideas that were terrible for games? You know what? <laughs> you know, how how did you uh, decide? Um, it was interesting because um, it was things, all sorts of things. I mean, we would make internal demos, but it was things like when I touched the screen, um, there was a 20 millisecond latency between me touching the screen and the event reaching the program code. So is that acceptable for games? Well, no, it's not acceptable for games. It needs to be 10. And so it's like, how do we solve this problem? Well, we can't. Well, let's get everyone in the room. Let's get the hardware people, the glass people, the people who do the touch thing, the people who do the software, the people who do the, you know, the, um, the, the Objective-C software. Let's get them all into a room and meet. And then they'll be like, hey, I haven't seen you since launch of phone, and we can fix this. And so you work out how to make the latency 10. Um, and that's, I think that benefits you to all of iOS, you know, because the whole operating system benefits from improvements like that. Um, but we'd look at things like, you know, if I'm sitting in a Starbucks and I want to play a game over 3G, you know, again, or Wi-Fi in Starbucks against someone else in Starbucks, you know, how do I get around the router there? Because um, the routers at Starbucks are, you know, banned peer to peer within the store and so forth. And how do I? Um, it, it, it was full of the technical challenges of making an operating system that worked well with games. Um, it was a fantastic time, but I couldn't make games, so I left. And then you founded a GR, GRL, right? The yes. Giant robot lizard, or it's got various other uh, interpretations. So. Uh, I was looking at the game uh, Full Deck uh, Hold'em, <laughs> and as soon as I saw the concept for that, I just thought this is just this is this is it. You know, this is a brilliant idea because that's what poker is all about: is the poker face and everything. And then now you can actually see the person. So, you t tell me a little bit about this uh, this movement to uh, founding your own company, and then uh, the idea for the uh, Full Deck Hold'em. I well, I left. Apple to go make an adventure game, and because um, I ha I have this plan to go make an adventure game that um, um, I still haven't made, but I'm hoping to start on <laughs> soon. But my family was um, no, we, we want you to go make a card game, go make a solitaire game. Um, so I really don't want to make a solitaire game. Who, who who makes solitaire games anymore? And you know, my family can be quite influential over me, um, so I ended up making a solitaire game and um, a, a full deck solitaire. And it became the number one solitaire game on the Mac App Store, and it's the number one free download, and it's, it's three million downloads later. So I had this great card game engine, and I thought to myself, well, how hard can it be to make a poker game? Well, it turns out that it's incredibly hard to make a poker game, because <laughs> the AI is incredibly hard to make. Um, and that, um, but I wanted to make a game that used the, you know, parts of the, you know, the, the iPad well, you know, which meant to be using the front-facing camera. Um, so that I could talk to people as I'm playing poker, and I could see the poker face. Um, it seems like an incredibly good idea to me, and I, I could go play with family. Um, it turns out that poker players, the last thing they want to do when they're playing online poker is see other people's faces. They, they hate that. It's, you know, they, they, they just, that then gives away their advantage, and they, they want to be anonymous. They want to be completely hide, so everyone switches it off. Um, and the last thing that... Um, um, the poker players want to do is play with their friends. They don't want to play with their friends. They want to play with other people who are good at playing poker. So as much as the game was technically, you know, complete and it had a great AI in it in the end that I laid over and you could play with your friends really easily and you could get online, you could chat with them. Um, no one who likes to play poker actually played it. Uh, it has a huge following in China, uh, which is, it meant I brought out a second version that had no English in any of the icons. Um, but yeah, I, I'm probably never going to make another poker game. Ah, <laughs> oh, you're bluffing. <laughs> um, uh, just you know, I saw you had a, a little a speech or an article here about uh, how to design games for your teenage daughter, and I was you know just just when I read that I was reminded me I, I reminded or I remembered a uh, going to see a band one time a, a sort of a yeah, metal band. These guys had told me you know, I was asking him what do you when you write songs you know what do you who do you uh, write songs for? And he's like, you got to go for the teenage girl market. <laughs> As you get the teenage girls interested, the guys will come, you know. So I'm just wondering, uh, how do you uh, target that market? Well, luckily, I have a teenage daughter. <laughs> Quite an asset in the, <laughs> in the games world. <laughs> so actually, I gave um, the talk at GDC with my daughter. And um, 
the idea of the talk was that we, we would go through all of my games from um, from clandestinely on or up and have her comment on why those games sucked and what was wrong with the games. And so I sat on stage and um, um, you know listened to her comments on the game and how what would have been better in the games for her. Um, so I'm trying to illustrate to other game designers. Um, you know, the best techniques to their work with teenagers is to listen to teenagers. And about it was interesting, about half the audience was like, oh my God, this is really useful to actually hear from a teenager with the, in, context to, in, in context to games. And the other half of the audience was like, oh my God, this was a tremendous waste of time hearing from a teenager. Um, I think half the audience will make better games. I think the other half of the audience needs to start listening to teenagers. So, it, 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 But it was a good talk and it was great to get on stage with my daughter. Love doing that. Okay, so just a, I got two questions left here. Uh, one is something I always ask, uh, you know, ask people is, is what advice do you give the the teenager uh, who wants to get a job in the games industry and maybe he's in high school right now, uh, wants to get some training, some experience. You know, how can they get from where they are now to where you are? Well, a the games industry is the best industry on the planet. Make sure you get into it. Don't give up on that dream. Uh, B stick with high school um, and. Um, all the way through to college and university. There are fantastic courses there. Don't ditch school. Um, and C, go find a local game company. There are so many local game companies that um, exist. You know, look up on the internet where an iOS game meetup is or a game jam is or a, um, um, an event is locally and go to it and introduce yourself to the game companies there. Ask if you can intern. Oh my gosh, you know, game companies love interns. Go in and you know and make levels. Learn, um, download Unity, download um, um, the iOS game kits, uh, but um, don't give up on getting into the game industry. It's uh, the, but go find those those the, the people in the game industry and talk to them and find someone that will talk to you, um, and will continue to encourage you along that path and uh, you know that's stick with it are there things that you look for on resumes golly um, it depends what I'm looking for um, if I if, if I'm looking for a program I ask them about hash tables if I'm looking for a designer I look for stories <laughs> um, and if I'm looking for a level designer I, I look to the other games that people have made and uh, the thing I look for on resumes is um, um, is you know, to tell the truth on a resume. You know, if you say you worked on a game, make sure you worked on that game because the game industry is not so large that, uh, you know, I, I've had people claim that they come to me and claim they worked on Seventh Guest. In an <laughs> well, not knowing. <laughs> that's, that's not a good way to get a job. So it, it's okay if you haven't made a game before. You, if you come in with a passion and you come in with a, um, and, and tell the truth about your passion, that will always... That's always a big plus with me. The final question I have here is a kind of a speculative, speculative uh, question. This, you know, somebody who's sort of been on the forefront of a lot of huge shifts in uh, the game, gaming technology. I wonder where you, uh, what do you think games will be like ten years from now, and then twenty, and then thirty years from now? Oh my gosh! I think we'll all have uh, implants in our head, and we'll just sit and go. Mm. <laughs> um, first thing. Um, Golly, I wish I'd known this ahead of time. The, um, I think there's no bad games out right now. I think a lot of game developers sit and say, oh, I hope Farmville's dead, but um, everyone should go play Farmville because it actually has addictive qualities. Um, I don't think people realize right now the revolution that is happening in, um, in mobile gaming gives people access to games and technology 24 hours a day, seven days a week that's connected. Um, so I think game developers who are making games for PCs and making games for consoles and making games for um, devices that I'm only going to spend a few hours at a day um, are going to start missing out on games that follow you around. Um, Twitter follows you around all day. Um, I tweet on my desktop and then I tweet on my phone and I tweet on my iPad whilst I'm watching the TV and I tweet, you know, you know right before I go to bed. Um, games should be doing that too. Uh, games should be following you around that much. I should be on a game on my PC, a game on my phone, and it should be the same game. Um, I think games will start to take advantage of that, and those will be some great games. Um, I don't think anyone's done that game yet. 
I think as we go into the future, the connectedness will only uh, grow as people become aware of it. Um, the, I, I think one of the big things to look for in gaming is not so much the games will change, it's the, the people have changed. Um, and the next group that's currently, you know, two will be 22 and 32, and, and, and those people will just scare the, you know, that they're entering a world where they have internet 24 seven and they can do 17 things at once. And they're going to be, you know, connected to encyclopedias, you know, the age four. And, uh, um, if, if things go right, that it's going to be a fabulous generation that, uh, is going to support me well into my nineties. <laughs> but, um, that game player is very different from the, from me as a game player, uh, very different from me growing up playing an 8-bit, uh, you know, 2600 uh, or, or Commodore 64, and those gamers are going to be hard to design for. So I just hope I'm here. So do you see PC gamers evolving differently than Mac gamers? No, I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, it looks like we're, you know, I'm out of questions here. I was just wondering, is there anything that you would like to mention, maybe a, a website people can go to, to to learn more about your current work or even your, your older your older games where they can buy those? Yeah, you can go to uh, grlgames.net. So, uh, I try to keep it pretty up to date, but uh, I've been crunching the last uh, gosh knows how many months now, so it's, uh, it's a few months out of date, but I will update it with this link when it goes live. Um, but... Uh, no, I'm, um, I'm looking forward to getting this next game out, and uh, then I am bringing the adventure game back, and that is what I'm going to do. Yeah, I don't know how much you can talk about this, this, this game that you're working on now. Is it kind of confidential? Or? I've actually given a little bit of clues on it. I'm going to, I'll let you in on a secret. This is the story. <laughs> I'm going to invent a time machine, and I'm going to make the entire country believe in an urban legend, and I'm going to convince everyone that the urban legend is real and I am going to scare the heck out of you all. Wow. <laughs> all right, you heard it here, folks. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a brand new retrospective. And remember, guys, if you'd like to see a game of your choice on the air, then just submit a short 10 to 15 second video. Tell me your name, where you're from, and the game you would like me to look at. Then I'll put your name into the drawing and roll the trusty D20, and we'll see what game gets selected. Very exciting, guys. Uh, just if you do the video, uh, just send me a note on YouTube or Facebook or email or whatever, and let me know where it is, and I'll add it to the list. And thank you very much for that. Also, thank you to everyone who has been donating and supporting the show. It's very important. The show is completely uh, sponsored by guys just and gals just like you. So if you'd like to make a donation, go over to armchairarcade.com and dial it in. I've added some more tiers for the uh, subscriptions. So now you have an option, uh, several different uh, payment schedules. So hopefully there'll be something there within your price range. Thank you very much for that. Now, what about that ale of the week? So this week I've got a little number called the Horny Copia Pumpkin Ale. This is brewed by the Horny Goat Company out of Wisconsin. Apparently it's brewed with uh, real pumpkin. I don't see that on the bottle anywhere, but it says uh, natural flavors. So I'm just assuming, hoping that it's an actual pumpkin. But anyway, let's get her open and see what it's all about. So I've got some of this pumpkin ale here in the old drinking horn. By the way, if you would like to own a drinking horn, I just uh, got to see the uh, the maker of these horns again last Saturday. It's a guy named Steiner E. or Crazy Viking. I'll post a link to his page in the show notes if you'd like to uh, buy a horn from him. Does really good work and he's a really good, uh, hilarious guy. It's lots of fun to run into him. He does a lot of the uh, festivals around here. So check him out if you'd like to, to own a horn or stay in a Viking uh, themed bed and breakfast. I haven't got to do that yet, but I'd really like to. But anyway, I was smelling this, and I'm really excited about it because uh, two of my favorite things in life are pumpkin pie and ale, and I think I'm about to get both. I mean, this smells like a pumpkin pie, a really good one, uh, sitting out on a windowsill. Uh, so let's give it a taste. Mmm. Very smooth. Okay, there's the... Yeah, you definitely taste the, uh, the pumpkin spice in this. Uh, not a very thick, it's kind of a thin, 
uh, a thinner ale. Um, it's not very syrupy at all. It's very sort of light, uh, refreshing. The there's no bitterness here. I really don't taste any uh, alcohol in this at all. Really, just a a nice uh, light ale with a pumpkin flavor. Uh, so very nice, uh, very crisp. Um, I would like to have it a bit thicker and a bit more alcohol in it, but what can you do? Uh, let's give this one a 3 out of 5 horns. Uh, definitely check this out if you like pumpkin uh, like I do. Anyway, let's finish up with the quotation. And the quotation for this week is uh, adapted slightly from something said by Robert A. Heinlein. And it goes something like this. Don't handicap your children by giving them easy games. See you guys next week. How am I going to go to this meeting with a fresh bite mark on my neck? Don't go. Yeah, right. I can afford to miss it. I'm trying to run a business. It's about money. You can do whatever you want, Chuck. <laughs> Oh, <laughs>